So we know from the last video that um, flow of blood, movement of blood, uh, is proportional to the amount of pressure you have in your arteries, uh, and inversely proportional uh, to the amount of peripheral resistance, meaning pressure speeds it up, resistance slows it down. But ultimately, you want a pressure gradient because blood flows from uh, an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure, just like anything else, right? Everything flows from high pressure to low pressure. Um, you would probably too if I told you you could learn the exact same amount in a different class that was easier, right? Lower pressure, you would probably uh, take that chance. Now we know that blood pressure is greatest right after you leave the heart. Um, so blood pumps out of that ventricle and the aorta is the highest the pressure gets, right? Just like right after you kick a soccer ball, the soccer ball is moving as fast as it's going to move, right? Um, if you're going to get hit by a soccer ball, you'd rather not be right next to the person who kicked it. You'd rather be far away because the ball is going to slow down. Well, so is your blood as you move from your arteries through your capillaries and into your veins. And so here is a look uh, at blood pressure as it moves through your arteries and capillaries and veins. It's much, much smaller. So how do we maintain blood flow? Well, while pressure goes down, um, resistance is also going to go down. So this shows you the diameter of the vessels, starting with the aorta, where the diameter is very large. And then as it branches into smaller and smaller arteries and eventually capillaries, the diameter of those vessels goes way down, which means resistance goes up, right? As diameter gets smaller, resistance gets higher, peripheral resistance. And then as you get into the veins, blood pressure is very low, but the diameter of the veins gets large very quick. And that means peripheral resistance is far lower. And that means that while blood pressure continuously goes down, as we saw in the other graph, this is blood flow. Blood flow drops, but then comes back up in the veins because uh, the diameter of the veins has gotten uh, much bigger and peripheral resistance has then decreased. So even though you have less pressure, you have less resistance as well. And so fl uh, flow pops back up. So now let's talk about what happens at the capillaries. Um, so capillaries are the place where exchange occurs, meaning stuff uh, goes from the blood plasma into the, uh, the interstitial fluid and the cells, and then from the interstitial fluid and the cells back into the blood plasma. And that occurs through diffusion, just movement down your concentration gradient, and also filtration, which is going to be a function of pressure uh, and reabsorption, which is going to be a function primarily of uh, osmosis, which we'll talk about in a second. So diffusion, we hopefully are pretty familiar with from last semester. It's just movement from where you have a lot of something to where you have a relatively small amount of something, and you're always going to move from a high concentration to a low concentration. It happens most effectively and quickly when the distances are short, and so that's why we have those single cell layer thick uh, walls of the capillaries, very small distance happens most effectively when the concentration is large. And so <clears throat> you have the most exchange where you have, for instance, a lot of oxygen in your blood and very little in your tissue, or a lot of waste in your tissue and very little in your blood. And when the ions or molecules involved are small, right? Large things have a harder time diffusing, uh, especially depending on the medium that they're diffusing across. Now, filtration means stuff actually moving uh, across a membrane, usually through those, you know, fenestrations perhaps, or in between cells, uh, or in between molecules of phospholipids, right? And so um, this has to do with pressure, right? Um, specifically, capillary hydrostatic pressure. And hydrostatic pressure is any kind of pressure where it's a fluid pushing on the walls that the fluid contains, right? So I have coffee in here, uh, and the walls of this cup have to be strong enough to prevent the coffee from knocking it over. All right, if I had like, this is a window into my life, here was a snack in here. If it was this kind of plastic and I put the coffee in there, it would push the sides over and it would spill everywhere, right? Um, so that hydrostatic pressure is that pressure that would push the plastic out. Um, this has to be, again, strong enough to push back so that it doesn't fall over. Your blood creates a a pressure to push on the walls of your blood vessels. We call it blood pressure. So capillary hydrostatic pressure is just blood pressure, but it's the blood pressure in your capillaries and it's pushing from inside of the capillaries out 
towards your interstitial fluid. Um, that said, you also have a pressure pulling back in toward your the inside of your capillaries, and that's blood colloid osmotic pressure. And osmotic pressure means the pressure of osmosis, meaning water tends to diffuse towards where you have more solutes, right? And you have a lot of solutes in your uh, blood that are too big to diffuse out, so like proteins. And so water is going to flow towards those proteins. And so you have opposing forces here. And at the beginning, this capillary hydrostatic pressure is higher than the colloid osmotic pressure. And you don't have to know these numbers, but 35 pushing out versus 25 pulling in the osmotic pressure, that's a net of 10 out. So the net flow of fluid is going to be out towards your, your tissue fluid. That makes sense. Well, you've got lots of good solutes in here that you want to push out, things like you know, amino acids and, and glucose and other things that are dissolved in water and sodium. Um, and as this water leaves, right, like a balloon, a water balloon that's full, but you didn't tie it right away, and you let it go and it... Pfft, right, sends the water out everywhere. But as it loses water, um, there's less force pushing out, right? And so eventually it kind of just dies down. To, right? Um, I don't know if that helps at all. But um, so as we lose that fluid, the hydrostatic pressure, the blood pressure in your capillaries is lower because there's less fluid there. And so it goes down to 25 and then 18. And by the end, um, you have the same number of proteins inside. So the same colloid osmotic pressure pulling in that same 25 millimeters of mercury pressure pulling in is now higher than the blood pressure pushing out. And so whereas we were pushing fluid out on net at the beginning of your capillary beds, as we get toward the veins, we are on net pulling fluid back in. And that's going to include a lot of wastes, et cetera, et cetera. And it's also going to make sure we have enough fluid um, to, uh, to move this stuff back along. So we have blood in your veins, right? Uh, and then all along the same time, you still have diffusion occurring, right? We're going to have more oxygen and more nutrients in your capillaries, and that's going to flow out where you have very little in your tissues. You have a lot of waste in your tissues. It's going to flow in where you have very little waste in your blood. So we're not always sending the exact same amount of blood to all of our tissues at once. Um, sometimes your tissues might require more blood because they're using up more oxygen or more glucose, things like that, right? Um, so... You know, right now, the muscles in my larynx, uh, I'm using them a lot. Uh, the muscles in my legs, not so much because I'm just sitting here on my uh, high knee. So um, if I get up and jog later, uh, then I'll be you know, using those muscles in my legs a lot more. Uh, so we have to regulate tissue perfusion. Perfusion is the, the blood flow through tissues, right? They have to be adequately perfused. And there are both a local uh, level of regulation. We call this auto-regulation. That just means self-regulation. Um, and if that is not sufficient, we also have central regulation, right? If you can't take care of it on your own, you call into central command uh, and they uh, help if, if the auto-regulation is not effective. In terms of auto-regulation, um, if your blood flow is low to a particular organ, um, then you have local chemicals that will be released called vasodilators just right at the site that will cause the precapillary sphincters to dilate and allow more blood into those capillary beds. Or the arterioles may uh, dilate and allow more blood into those capillary beds. Either way, uh, if you have low oxygen or low perfusion, uh, local chemicals can just cause you to bring in more blood immediately by, by relaxing those sphincters and, and, and dilating the arterioles and bringing in blood. That said, sometimes that's not enough, right? If I'm really going jogging, I live at the bottom of a big hill, right? So to get to the top, I'm, you know, I'm winding myself. Uh, so auto regulation is probably not going to be sufficient. So I have to go back to some kind of central regulation. And central regulation means like the central nervous system, right? Your brain, uh, and, and that means you're going to have both uh, neural um, mechanisms of, of cranking up uh, your perfusion and endocrine, probably chemical um, mechanisms. So neural means your sympathetic nervous system maybe uh, is going to crank up that heart rate, right? Um, your SA node is going to start beating faster. You're uh, going to then crank up your cardiac output and therefore crank up your blood pressure to your entire body. And that is going to help perfusion of, you know, your legs, for instance, your quadricep muscles. Um, now, you can also release, you know, norepinephrine or epinephrine or some sort of vasoconstrictor, which is going to cause your blood vessels all over your body, many of them, to constrict, 
Uh, that means less volume for the same amount of blood. That means blood pressure goes up. Again, just like putting your thumb on the end of a hose and it makes the water go further, right? Because less volume for the same amount of stuff equals higher pressure. And so again, neural and endocrine regulations that can um, crank up your entire body's blood pressure uh, if you're not perfusing any particular uh, one part sufficiently. And in terms of regulating your, your global blood pressure, like your whole body's blood pressure, um, you have receptors in a few very specific places uh, that are baroreceptors. Baro meaning pressure. Okay. If you've heard of barometric pressure, um, anyway, baro means pressure. And so baroreceptors um, are present in your carotid sinuses, aortic sinuses, and atrium. Carotid sinuses are at the base of your internal carotid arteries, which is what we'll talk about in a bit, um, feed your brain. And so if you're not getting sufficient uh, blood pressure in the vessel that goes to your brain, you're going to want to know that immediately. Um, this can happen you know, if you were sleeping or something or laying down and you get up quickly for some reason. Sometimes you say blood rushes to your head or you feel heady. Really what happens is that you're not getting enough blood to your head. Um, and very quickly, your carotid sinuses are going to realize that and they're going to cause you to crank up your heart rate, crank up your blood pressure. You also have similar uh, baroreceptors in your aortic sinuses, which makes sense. That's where your blood pressure is highest, coming right out of your left ventricle, in your right atrium, right? Um, well, I'm kind of on the wrong side of my body, but um, your right atrium uh, is also going to have baroreceptors to alert you to differences uh, in blood pressure. So let's say your blood pressure goes up, right? Your baroreceptors in your uh, carotid sinuses, your aortic arch, uh, your right atrium, they're all going to notice this increase in blood pressure. They're going to stimulate your baroreceptors, right? This is going to tell the part in your brain that worries about this stuff, which is in your medulla oblongata, hey, we need to lower our blood pressure a little bit. So you're going to activate your cardio inhibitory center, which means you're going to send a parasympathetic signal to your SA node in your heart saying, cool it, slow that heart rate down, right? which is going to lower your cardiac output and therefore your blood pressure. You're also going to send signals to uh, vasodilate, meaning instead of constricting your blood vessels, make them bigger. And more volume for the same amount of, um, of fluid means less pressure, right? And, and these two things will reduce your blood pressure back to normal. If your blood pressure drops, uh, similarly, your bar baroreceptors are going to detect that. They're going to send that information to your medulla oblongata, and you are going to increase your cardiac output by increasing your heart rate, and you're going to vasoconstrict, which will uh, increase blood pressure. You have multiple different organisms that can produce hormones or endocrine responses that will regulate um, your uh, circulatory system or your cardiovascular function, your blood pressure, and they include your heart, your kidneys, your pituitary gland. And some of these hormones are more uh, short-term hormones um, in terms of, of immediate relief to blood pressure changes, and some of them are longer-term responses. Uh, your immediate, like very short-term responses, um, come from your adrenal medulla, and they are epinephrine. If your blood pressure drops uh, quickly, you may secrete epinephrine and norepinephrine from your adrenal medulla or adrenaline, right? Uh, and you may cause your heart rate to crank up and vasoconstriction to occur, and you'll crank up your your blood pressure very quickly. Uh, in the longer term, uh, hormones like antidiuretic hormone, which cause you to retain fluid. Retaining fluid means more, more blood volume and more blood pressure. Um, aldosterone causes the retention of sodium, which causes the retention of fluid, uh, which again, more blood volume means more blood pressure. Angiotensin II um, works with aldosterone uh, and antidiuretic hormone and, and another hormone called renin. Um, and it causes uh, constriction of your blood vessels, which again, increases blood pressure, also stimulates thirst. And erythropoietin, as we've already learned, uh, stimulates the production of red blood cells, which again has to do with blood volume and higher blood volume means higher blood pressure. So if your blood pressure drops in addition to epinephrine immediately, your kidneys are going to make erythropoietin and renin, which activates angiotensin and aldosterone and ADH, which are all going to increase blood volume, make you more thirsty, which also increases blood volume. And all of that is going to bring your blood pressure back up to normal.